This Week in Radio Tech. Episode 145 is brought to you by the Axia Radius IP Audio Mixing Console. Radius is the affordable IP audio console with big console features. On the web at axiaaudio.com slash radius. And now, our feature presentation, Twerd. Let's say you own a radio station in San Diego and you need technical help. Who are you going to call? Bill Eisenhammer, of course. All right, calm down. He says that to everyone. This calls for immediate discussion. What's up, guys? Yeah, all your days are belong to us. Yeah. From his palatial office of important business. Or in a choice hotel in a distant land. This is Kirk Harnack. Bill Eisenhammer is talking about transmitters and studios and why system integration is key. It's twerk number 145. You're dialed in to This Week in Radio Tech. It's time for This Week in Radio Tech. Hey there, I'm Kirk Harnack and I'm so glad you've joined us. You've come to the right place to hear us bitch about radio. I mean, talk about radio engineering. Did I say that? I think I did. We're on the GFQ network. We can loosen our tie a little bit and and and, and uh, you know lean back, cut cut loose. Uh, I'm the host of the show. I started the show a few years ago and uh, started out as an audio only show for the first 20 episodes. Then we went whoa video, and now we're glad to be on the GFQ network. Our show this week in radio tech is brought to you by the folks at Axia, makers of the f- wonderful, cute, awesome little radius console. We'll be telling you about that in just a little while. Uh, Andrew has installed one at uh, his GFQ network uh, command center. All right. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the only host on the show today. Uh, Chris Tarr and Tom Ray, either one of those guys were going to be with us. They are both facing terrible traffic uh, on the way to their own home studios right now. So one or both of them may join us during the show, but that's okay. We have a guest who's easily going to fill the whole hour and, and then some with uh, fun, frivolity information, maybe some serious things about broadcast engineering. I want to introduce to you a guy that I'm, I'm glad to have on the show. been talking to him, to him for a few months about being on, and that is Bill Eisenhammer from the San Diego area. Hey, Bill, how are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me on. I'm just delighted to, to have you on here. And tell me, okay, I'm, I know I've screwed your last name up a few times. It looks like I should be saying Eisenhammer, but that's not right, is it? No, that's not right. It's hammer with one M. Okay. It's hammer, hammer with one M. That's good. Yeah, it's a hammer with one M. Eisenhammer. So <laughs> at least that's okay. what my parents told me. Now, now, Bill, they could have been lying. I, I, <laughs> don't know. Bill, I see you on uh, various places on the internet uh, talking, chatting, posting about broadcast engineering. And uh, Bill, I don't know if I've met you in person or not. I don't recall ever having meeting you in person. Did I and just forgot or have I not? I do not recall. I don't think so. Maybe in okay. passing. I'm hiding behind Maybe. something on the NAB floor. I don't know. <laughs> so, so Bill, I was uh, Kirk Harnack. I, I was a contract engineer for about 15 years. Most of that time, based out of Memphis, Tennessee, took care of a lot of stations uh, in the, the mid South, uh, West Tennessee, you know, East Arkansas, uh, Southern Missouri, um, and uh, Northern Mississippi. That whole area there. And uh, man, I had a great time being a full time contract engineer. I got out of that business about the time that the telecom law of 96 came along and I, I to me I saw some writing on the wall that said you know what stations are going to consolidate and there's going to be some extra engineers hanging around uh, don't know how secure their jobs are going to be and maybe now is a good time to get out of contract engineering so I you know I guess I made the right decision for me but I understand you are you're in the trenches you're a contract engineer is that right I kind of do contract on the side, but I am oh, so, okay. a full time. I am a full time radio engineer. Okay, I work, well, for, I, I work for Lincoln Financial Media in San Diego. Oh, I have, all right. Okay, I have radio stations. I have to take care of you, and they're my priority. But all right, that so doesn't that doesn't mean I can't go online. <laughs> and now that no, that's just changed my perspective just a little bit. So you're full time with the guys at Lincoln Financial, great company. These guys run some awesome radio stations. Uh, in fact, uh, one of your um, one of your your coworkers over in Miami is a good friend of mine, Rob Sidney. Rob's the program director for WLYF, and I've known Rob for years and years. In fact, he used to be part owner of some radio stations uh, with me. I don't suppose you know Rob, do you? I don't know Rob. Yeah, well, he's he's been with Lincoln Financial, or he's been with the company which is now owned by Lincoln Financial for like twenty five years, and just got a contract renewal as a, as their PD at WLYF. So anyway, <clears throat> enough inside baseball. Um, so how many stations are you taking care of there in San Diego for for Lincoln Financial? 
We have uh, four FMs here, and uh, one of them is a simulcast of our main signal. So we have uh, we have uh, the well-known one, KSON, which is the uh, country station. And I have to say that is the station of the year, Marconi winner for uh, large market. Wow. Um, we, just, we just got that little uh, baby in the mail in one piece this uh -huh. time. The first one came a little damaged. Uh, and we also have uh, KIFM. And we have KBZT, which is our FM 94.9 station. Uh, KSOQ is our simulcast of KSON, which oh, okay. is the class A right. that takes care of our North County area. Well, this is a pretty full-time job. I, these, these four uh, FMs, um, I guess, are, are some of them automated and some uh, you know, reasonably full-time uh, staffed? We have full-time staff on the stations with... Uh, a couple of them, you know, voice tracking is definitely uh, becoming the norm, but we do have uh, each station at least has three full-time air talent. Now, Kason has the biggest staff. So, ah, gotcha. All right. Um, but we, we do uh, voice tracking overnight, like I'd say 99.9% .9 of the country um, in the radio world. And, and most uh, day parts are covered with a live person for the, uh, you know, the big, big part of the day. Morning. We'll, we'll uh, drive. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about the stations you work for on the on the side uh, a bit later on. These this, the stations uh, f um, uh, there that you're on your full time job. What do you find nowadays? You've been doing this a while, right? You've been doing this. I was uh, actually kind of scary because I was I was kind of like counting on my fingers and I ran out of space. And <laughs> when I first uh, started getting into this, I I came up with the number twenty two. So I've been mm. doing this twenty two years. Okay. Um, so. so here we are in, in 2012, um, uh, thinking about engineering. What, what do you find is, is, um, maybe your, your biggest challenge nowadays? And, and is that any different than when you first got in, into the business of engineering? Oh, the biggest challenge. Um, it's not keeping busy. That's for sure. Uh, it's, it's more of, especially that I've moved up in the uh, world and, uh, you know, being the chief engineer, you got a lot of paperwork to do, which is not what we all want to do. We want to get our hands dirty. Um, but the, I think the challenge more is keeping up with technology and trying to integrate it into our radio stations. Um, I think, you know, it sounds easy, but it's, it's not. Most of uh, radio seems to be stuck in a, in a, uh, you know, a lull and they don't want to move forward or try something new and, you know, trying to get something new and exciting to work for you is is always fun and we always try to try to move forward on that so back in the day you started out in this business i guess around 1990 and and i happened to get started about probably eight or nine years uh, earlier than that seems like um when i was coming up in the world of contract engineering and 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 uh, working uh, almost full-time for a couple of stations um you know our, our my biggest challenge was was things like um uh, keeping the, the transmitter on. We had all tube-based transmitters at that time. So tube-based transmitters, you've got airflow, you've got heat, you've got um, uh, high voltages, that you know, thing, things that can arc over. So you got the, the, the transmitter maintenance. Of course, you, you had, I guess, transmission line and antenna maintenance, um, and that really hasn't changed. Let, let's talk about the RF side of things for a while. What, what's become easier or maybe what's become harder about the whole transmission side of things for you? Ooh, the uh, easy part is I'm a big fan of solid state. Um, it's, it sure does make your job easy. Reliability, uh, maintenance, replacing things when you have to, uh, parts, it's, it's easy nowadays to do that. Uh, I have to say the tube transmitters have gotten much better, too. We still have uh, a couple of those puppies, and, and they just run fine. So from that side... Um, you have the maintenance to do, but it's the reliability has been there. Of course, the challenge nowadays is, uh, especially in California, we got the EPA. You got certain things where you can't use, uh, you know, solder or whatever, and you and you find failures uh, from cheap capacitors and stuff like that, and, you, and it drives you nuts. But uh, since everything is components in and redundancy, which is what I really like about the uh, solid-state transmitters, um, is if you do have a failure, you can a you're still on, and b you can get it replaced, and and you're not taking yourself off the air 
uh, for an extended period of time at all. Um, and then uh, you, you talk about transmission line and antennas. Uh, we have an antenna that's going on 25 plus years now. And yeah, we consider replacing it, but it still works. Transmission line's old, still works, been shot at, had a hole in it once. <laughs> Section got replaced. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I thought that just—I thought that just happened in Mississippi. No, <laughs> it happens in a big city too. So, oh yeah. my goodness! I, so I used to take care of a tra- of I, I used to take care of a transmitter site that that was not far from uh, several trailer houses in Mississippi. Of course, I, I guess that could be anywhere in the state. And I—I uh, I just know, I just know that some good old boys sat on their front porch out in front of the trailer and said, "Hey, you reckon I can I can hit shoot that light out up there?" <laughs> yeah, and they missed. There were, <laughs> they missed, but sometimes they'd hit the coax. Yeah, yeah, how, one time I, yeah we, that's what uh, I say. How did they hit a four-inch line? How did they miss the beacon? No. So, <laughs> but you know that's about, exactly what's happening. The thing about shooting now, we did find we did find pieces of uh, of beacon uh, lens in in the in the bean field around the tower. Um, but the, uh, that's got to be instant gratification, you know, to sit on your porch. Uh, with, with your rifle, and if if you hit that beacon, it, you just it, it's likely to extinguish, right? <laughs> if you hit it right, oh yeah, I if, think if so. It right, you know? It's, it's going to go. If you out. hit it right, yeah, I, you know, I think you can shatter that glass and not have the bulb break, but yeah, you know, the bulb will go pretty soon after that. I don't know. I, for some reason, I just wouldn't have thought that'd be a problem in uh, in Southern California. But I uh, yeah. well, the it. other thought was uh, maybe there was a I uh, should I say a uh, little issue of uh maybe an argument going on in the neighborhood and somebody decided to take a shot at somebody mm, well, well, no. yeah. of course they <laughs> missed by almost 600 feet <laughs> up but <laughs> don't it know how they lateral damage. Damage. yeah exactly <laughs> or it could so, be one of those celebrations you know like they have in in uh, in the middle east they take you know take pistols outside and start shooting up in the air yeah. Fourth of July, they were shooting up in the air, and you know, a month later, something came down and hit it. And I don't know, <laughs> but Jeez. yeah, that you know, that was a headache for a while because that section we could never get it right because it kept leaking. And you know, with the advent of HD, we had to uh, make sure that everything was working there. And yeah, yeah, that was a leak, so we got it repaired. So, um, so tell me about about solid state transmitters. You, you've uh, mentioned this. What what's the most powerful solid state transmitter you're taking care of? Uh, ours, uh, would be the 20 kilowatt versions. We have, uh, a pair of, uh, NV twenties from Nautel. They are running half power, but, um, those are the largest. And then I've also got myself a little, uh, that KSOQ is a class A. It's a, it's a pea shooter works well. And that's running a, uh, one kilowatt, uh, older, uh, V1D, uh, by dot Nautel. So oh, that's see, it. it t- this twenty kilowatt power level that amazes me. Uh, my, I, you know, I'm part owner of a few stations in uh, Mississippi and American Samoa, and the, the biggest solid state transmitter we have, I think, is about a thirteen hundred watt, um, uh, and I think it may be a, a Bext brand, uh, and we got a couple thousand watt and some five hundred watt transmitters. But man, I've I've never um, taken care of a twenty kilowatt FM transmitter. You said you're running at, at half power, but still, this this is kind of a, a Haas uh, solid state transmitter. What? What fundamentally, I mean, okay, I know it's solid state versus tube, but from a, a, the point of view of installation, airflow, thinking about long-term maintenance or regular maintenance, w- what do you have to think about with a, a big solid state transmitter as opposed to a tube transmitter? Biggest problem is heat. Heat is big time. And, and then I've got to thank HD for that one also. Um, we found after installing these uh, transmitters that the airflow we needed was much more than what we had for the room, so we had to bolster our air conditioning situation. Um, we moved uh, basically the two stations are housed in in one building, and and we have uh, the uh, two uh, NVs are our mains, and we have a couple Z10s, which are our backups uh, for these stations. So you know, if we had all four running in the room, two in the dummies, and that it, it gets pretty hot in there. But even just the uh, the HD transmitters running by themselves. So here we went from a room that had about eight tons of air uh, max with uh, two um, split units. Uh, we determined it was time to upgrade uh, shortly after the HD stuff went in um, just to cover the heat and ended up putting in three five-ton split units. So we have a total of 15 tons of air 
for a room that's about uh, 17 by 14. Wow. So oh, my that's gosh. That's a lot that's of a air. That's a lot of air. Hey, in the uh, in the chat room, Dave Anderson chimes in and, and mentions that the the NV series. Now these are made, I believe, by Nautel. Uh, it's a solid state big FM transmitter from Nautel. It says they have an efficiency of about forty eight to fifty percent. Does that sound about right? Uh, kind of low. I'm running mine. Uh, mine had to be readjusted, but uh, I have uh, one running about sixty five percent on DC to RF, and the other one's running about sixty two percent. Okay, and, and we talk about that in, in, in terms of DC to RF. Uh, explain that for a minute for the folks in the chat room and the folks listening that may not know what that means. Efficiency from, from uh, well, I, I guess I would say from AC to RF, but you, you tell me what you mean by that. Well, DC is a uh, nice thing about solid state is, you know, you, you go from all the high voltage uh, stuff that you get with the uh, tube type, which I have a couple of uh, large jobs for that. Um, to solid state, you get the AC feed and it comes in and you're feeding these power supplies and everything runs on low voltage DC. Um, so your efficiency is how much of that can be transferred into RF power. Um, um, the biggest transfer that, you know, the, the biggest problem with that in a solid state transmitter is I was explaining to my, uh, part-time assistant, uh, when we're going through it, he had the question, Okay. Why do we have all these little amps in this stuff? stuff? And, and it's like, well, you got to take this feed from your exciter and you got to amplify it. Well, what's the design they came up with? These brilliant minds out there, they came up with a design. Well, you take that feed, we'll split it. Okay, now we're going to split it again. So now you got it in the case of an NV20, you've split that feed um, so it feeds eight power amp modules. Well, mm -hmm. each power amp module has eight power amps inside them. Hmm. So that's where your power is coming from. Well, guess what? Now you've got to transfer that all back once you got the power to one output. And yeah. then you've got your matching and your combiners, and you're creating a lot of heat. Um, so, you know, there, there's your inefficiencies, your inefficiencies with solid-state components, um, which seems to be improving every day. Um, I got to see, um, I should say that when I first installed the NVs, we were running closer to 50, 55% efficiency. But being that they were the first ones, um, I got to do the software updates all the way to the current version. Um, I've also got to do field modifications based on uh, what they've learned over the years from their NV40s, which came out just prior to the 20s um, and by incorporating these changes they've you know they've upped the efficiency um, based uh, the, in the fact that we are running these into a master antenna system um, we also have a uh, we're tenants at this site so we feed a uh, massive dielectric uh, combiner mm. and we have to deal with uh, that match which we don't have control of so uh, as they <laughs> changed out recently in antenna, my I can probably take one of them back up. I had one running almost seventy percent efficient, based on uh, you know what I've learned from the manufacturer and and a little experimenting with uh, HDPA volts and stuff like that by changing some of the, uh, the 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 power, basically the voltage levels to the amps. Um, I was able to get about seventy percent efficiency on one of the transmitters. You know, one, one of the things that I was asking about efficiency of solid state, uh, so the, the transmitters that I deal with that are solid state are so relatively small that we don't really uh, worry so much about efficiency at, you know, at, at a kilowatt. We're still talking about, you know, a, a little more than a hair dryer's worth of electricity. When you talk about the power levels that you're doing, you you, you, you can spend some money on, on electricity. So you, you want to be sure that it's as efficient as it can be. And w right. when I came up in engineering, Anything, you know, any transmitter, uh, even, a, even a kilowatt transmitter, but anything higher than a kilowatt was going to have a tube in it. Now, the, the good thing about a tube amplifier for FM, it doesn't need to be a linear amplifier. Well, of course, it does if you're doing HD, but you know, back in the day, um, uh, before there right. was HD, these uh, amplifiers in transmitters could be what we call a Class C amplifier. And uh, we've talked about this before on, on a very early version of the show about FM amplification. But a Class C amplifier is is kind of like if you take your bicycle 
and you turn it upside down so it's resting on the seat and the handlebars and you got the wheel in front, you got the front wheel in front of you and if you just spin the front wheel and just give it a little kick every now and then that's what a class C amplifier is like you just give it a kick every now and then and it and it, it amplifies it keeps on going um, and so you, in other words it doesn't have a big uh, you might call duty cycle for using power um, it it, uh, it it it's kind of it, it it resonates and uh, you just have to have to give it a kick. So a, a class C amplifier can be pretty efficient on the order of anywhere from seventy five percent to eighty eighty one eighty two maybe eighty five percent efficient with the amount of power coming into it in terms of uh, voltage times current in the power supply compared to the amount of wattage the RF wattage that you get out of it. So you know back in the day you're taking care of a ten kilowatt FM transmitter. The final amplifier you might put Put 12 or 13,000 watts of power into that circuit, and you'd get 10,000 watts of RF, uh, of amplified RF out of it. So that's great. Well, solid state devices typically have been a lot less efficient than, than a tube circuit. Um, and, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know much about these solid state amplifiers. Are they operating in a class C mode? Let's say you weren't doing HD a, at all. Um, would a solid state FM transmitter still be in a, in a class C uh, amplifier mode? That's a good question. Know. I've never really looked at it, but my guess is by design being solid mm -hmm. state, I would say yes. They're, they're well, no, they're not running class C. They probably border on uh, more of an AB. Uh, when you turn off the HD, um, you're able to regain um, power based on the fact that you're not generating this extra set of carriers. So your yeah, efficiency yeah, goes back yeah. up. But yeah, and, traditionally, an analog-only uh, solid-state transmitter is, has not been as efficient as a tube. And, and remember, when you are doing HD, if you're amplifying the, the whole signal or just amplifying an HD signal, you've got to amplify that in a, either a Class A or close to a Class A uh, way because they do depend on, on linear amplification. Uh, you've got to have incredibly good correlation with you know, phase and, and amplitude and, and all that. Uh, you, you can't just amplify it in, in a Class C sense. Um, so, uh, because the, you know, the, the amplitude makes a difference too. So and, and anyhow, I was just wondering about, about, you know, these, uh, solid state transmitters at these high power levels since I hadn't well, personally yeah, had going back to the uh, tube world. It, it's kind of mm -hmm. nice because the uh, one side I have does have an HT 25 as an aux analog only, ah. and we have an HT HD plus, which is our HD transmitter. Well, what that one is, is a modified HT 30 to be linear. Well, we can run a month on the 25, and you can see the difference in the power bill. Oh, sure. It's, it's, sure. it's, it's amazing. And even though the tube is actually, you know, tube transmitters running fairly efficient, <laughs> overall, you're like, well, I'm still generating the HD carriers. I'm still running linear. So, yeah, you see the difference in the, in the power bills when you, so when you turn things that, on and off like that. That, H, that HT plus HD transmitter, is that putting the HD carriers th through the tube as well? Yes. It's, okay. It's so that's level tube, combined. So that tube has to be uh, running in a in a mode that is has has some linearity. In fact, I think the folks at at Continental uh, did a great tutorial at, uh, about this. They back in the earlier days of HD, when people were saying, "No, there's no way you can do HD with a tube." Well, the folks at Continental put a a very powerful and, and accurate uh, uh, intermediate power amplifier before the tube, and then they ran the tube in a linear area such that um, you were getting FM at less efficiency than you would if you're running Class C amplification, and you got the HD carriers also, and it was linear enough to where it, it, it worked, if, if I understand their presentation correctly. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, Maybe that's, that's, what they're that's, doing that's with right. The um, yeah, that, that's pretty much right, and it's kind of fascinating because they actually, the power supplies are built a little different so mm -hmm. you can get the linearity and get it in that range um, because the uh, the the preamp which is really not a preamp but there it's a it's a little brick and it's a solid state brick mm -hmm. and that's what your 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 first amplification factor is on the tube and once you get that in there um, you know your output is now feeding this tube that like you said has been tuned or set up to run in the linear area, linear area of the, uh, of the waveform when you're generating the power. So 
um, it's it's interesting to actually tune an HD transmitter. It's it's time consuming ah, in terms uh, of yeah. getting it to work right and get your HD carriers where they need to be and get the mask closed. So when you run RTAC, things are actually meet mask. That that's um, really interesting. It's probably more like tuning a a uh, a television transmitter back in the days when when TV was analog, because uh, when when you were just tuning it for an analog FM signal, um, you know, a Class C amplifier, it was pretty much you to turn the knobs for maximum smoke. Not not entirely, but pretty close. You could. Yeah, on a lot of transfers, just tune it for the most output, and you'd be okay. Uh, now there were some fine tuning controls uh, to keep the, uh, for example, the AM uh, synchronous lo noise as low as possible. That didn't always coincide with the m most output, and sometimes the highest efficiency did not occur at the peak of output. Uh, you you might actually uh, uh, tune the transmitter. Uh, for less plate current, and uh, and and then and then bump up the screen voltage or the, or the drive or whatever to get more at, to get the right output level, and you'd have a higher efficiency. Uh, but for the most part, yeah, you just tune for maximum smoke and it would work. But that's not the case with uh, when <clears throat> when you're running HD, or uh, in, if you've ever tuned a, a television uh, uh, transmitter, at least an a an analog one. Um, no, tell I've me about done TV. Uh, <laughs> you can't send pictures <laughs> through the air. We know that. Yeah. You can't do that. You're That's why we got cable. <laughs> Don't tell the TV guys, though. So your uh, your HD stations, um, uh, in, in, in including any that aren't with your your primary uh, em employer, how many H how many stations are you working with that transmit an H some HD signals? All of ours do, mm -hmm. even the Class A jobber. Mm -hmm. Um. People I've talked to, most of, the, most of the side work is either on the phone or on the internet, uh, email, and there's a handful. They're out there, and then I, I kind of follow other people online and see what they're doing, and, and I'll see something interesting, and they'll, they'll make a comment about, oh, yeah, I have to do this today, and of course, I start putting two to two together. I go, huh, they're dealing with an HD transmitter now. Um, <laughs> And exactly that's what comes up, and then they find you know you find out oh they're going through some of the same headaches that you you run into, um, whether you're tuning or or not, and it's different. Say you're you're running, uh, you know we're on this to topic of how they run. We run um, FM plus HD in one box, and there's a lot of stations out there that take their analog and then they got a digital transmitter and then they do the high level combining and boom out the antenna that's a little bit easier to deal with too um, in my opinion I haven't had the pleasure of physically doing it and and, and then uh, we get our you know we're talking about Miami we get down to our my, you know our my coworker in and and pal Gary Blau down there uh, who just inherited uh, 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 a higher combined power setup where he's got two HD HD pluses and one's running analog the other one's running FM plus HD and then they combine that to get their uh, TPO and uh, ERP so he's got the extra pleasure of trying to make those suckers match after they're tuned up properly and he just inherited those so I spent a good uh, about 45 minutes on the phone with him yesterday uh, discussing how to tune the HD HD plus the FM plus HD side of life um, because it it is not intuitive hmm. but once you get the handle of it you're like oh and of course it's always scary once you like we were saying you tune for maximum smoke you're all happy yeah look this sucker's blowing right okay <laughs> take the loading crank it back about 30 minutes and you watch the thing drop down to 90 percent power output and you're like oh no no <laughs> but that's part of the deal and you know, it's something new to go, no, it won't be able to handle that because uh, I don't know how many, how many people have run a, an analog station transmitter and, and had it totally mismatched and mistuned and, and get themselves in trouble going, well, how come my tube died so soon? Uh, well, <laughs> now we're forcing it into that situation. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, luckily, hey, um, you know, between power supplies and stuff, they... They make them last. I've got almost three years out of one on the HTHC Plus, which has got to be close to a record. 
So, uh, folks, you are watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech, episode number 145. I'm Kirk Harnack, and our guest this week is a very interesting guy from the San Diego area, Southern California, Bill Eisenhammer. And uh, in when, when we come back, uh, we're going to take a little break here and talk about a sponsor for just a minute. And uh, I, when we come back, we're going to talk to Bill about uh, uh, some studio uh, uh, questions about building and maintaining studios. And also, Bill uh, writes, a, writes a, a blog. He's got this blog called Tech Notes from the Field, and it's just, I, I've looked at it a couple times before, looking at it now. It's terrifically interesting, including a, a recent um, reference to uh, tin whiskers. So if you've ever wondered about tin whiskers, you're going to want to stay tuned. Uh, right now, though, I want to take, tell you about our sponsor uh, this week. It's uh, my employer, the folks at Axia Audio. And um, I had the real distinct pleasure of spending a few days with Andrew Zarian at the GFQ Network uh, last week. And we installed uh, the, the smallest console that we make at, uh, at Axia. It's an Axia Radius console. And let's see if we can wake up uh, Andrew. Hey, Andrew, wake up. Hey, wake I'm up. here. Okay, good. Hey Andrew, if you got a camera, you can show us uh, your uh, your new Radius console. Yeah, oh, I got it wow. right on, I got a, I got an overhead shot of the uh, the setup right now. That is beautiful, except for the mic arm that you know kind of. I know. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll put it back here. <laughs> okay. Nice. Um, so uh, the uh, the Axia Radius console uh, is uh, now look if if you if you're looking for a console that's you know priced like a Behringer or a Mackie I'm I'm sorry this isn't it this is a broadcast console although you don't have to be a broadcaster to to get one uh, the 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 Radius console like all of the Axia consoles have uh, a, a big uh, chunk of them that is uh, in the world of, of IP of, of audio over IP. And the, the radius is no exception. It's got uh, a, an Ethernet switch built into the back of it. And you can bring sources in and send audio out over a network connection. And that's exactly what uh, the GFQ network, what Andrew Zarian is, is doing uh, there. In fact, uh, a couple of his, right now, a couple of his uh, computers that run Skype are being fed audio to them and from them uh, over uh, audio over IP. And so, uh, in fact, by the time we're done, we'll have all, all four of them on that. Um, uh, he's also using uh, IP audio, that is the live wire uh, protocol, to uh, uh, send audio to a couple other devices there in uh, his, uh, his place. There's the Omnia One audio processor, and there's also the, uh, the Telos ProStream, which is an audio processor and uh, streaming encoder uh, built in into one box. And so even though these boxes, the Omnia One and the Telos ProStream, they have standard connectors on the back for you know, XLR, for audio in and audio out. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Omnia One has uh, AES, EBU audio in and out if you want to use that. But we're not using any of those connectors. If you look at the back of, of both of those devices uh, in, in Andrew's rack, there's no audio connections to them. There's just a network connection. And that network connection is carrying the live audio over IP, the, the live streams, the very low latency uh, streams uh, over, over IP, standard IP. So it's, it's very cool. It goes together uh, very quickly. Um, we had a couple of interesting issues to troubleshoot there, mostly to just do with computers and uh, getting the right version of uh, an IP audio driver to shuck and jive with, uh, with Skype. And um, so, uh, Andrea, how, overall, now, how do you think it's working out for you? Are you getting better audio? Uh, yeah, actually. I, I do think the audio is, is f much better than what I was receiving uh, with my Mackie mixer. And that's no knock uh, against Mackie. But I, I, there, there's definitely a, a major quality difference between uh, pro-level audio equipment and consumer-level audio equipment. And uh, it's just interesting to, to hear it in my headphones and, and to kind of get used to using something like this because this is a whole different ball game you know one thing that's kind of interesting is uh if if uh, I, and I don't know which computer i'm I, am i on skype one uh, right now andrew or you one of the are other ones? you're on skype three uh skype three right now skype three is and skype three is one that we have an ip driver in or, or ip driver or sound okay so my voice goes into this uh, Heil microphone right here. It goes over to a little sure x2u converter that converts mic to a usb uh, from that point, it doesn't turn analog until it comes out your speakers 
wherever you're listening to my voice right now. It is digital. Now, it's various forms of digital. There are opportunities for uh, quality degradation if the digital isn't used right. But my voice stays ones and zeros all the way through. It never gets converted back to analog at, at Andrew's place. So it's digital through Skype. It's, uh, it's digital into the IP, you know, through the, the Windows uh, computers using into our IP audio driver. There's no sound card being used in that computer, uh, no traditional sound card. It comes out of that computer computer as audio over IP, live wire, and goes to the network, not to an audio input, but to the network switch that is part of the audio console. And then the audio console extracts the digital audio from that network stream, mixes it along with uh, you know, me and, and uh, Bill Eisenheimer on this show and, and Andrew Zarian's voice, uh, gets mixed together, and then goes right back out as a IP stream using the live wire protocol. So it's just... It's amazing, cool as can be, quick to plug together. Yeah, you, you know, I, I don't. Andrew, did we do any soldering? No, we didn't. I brought a soldering, no soldering. just in case, and we never had to bust it out. We we did everything without without soldering. So, it's cool. I would invite you to check it out if you have friends in broadcast. Uh, if you're not in broadcast, but you have friends who are, uh, be sure you let them know about Axia Audio. There's now well over three thousand Axia consoles on the air and in production rooms all around the world. And uh, we're just just delighted to uh, uh, to have all these consoles. We're delighted that this has worked out so well. Put a lot of effort into studying this and how to make it low latency and make it work well. And and uh, my goodness, thanks to the the, the really good folks at, at uh, Telos and and Axia, uh, it's 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 just all over the world. Kirk, one of the so, coolest things was uh, when we removed all the cable that we had with our prior connection, and we saw that gigantic pile <laughs> of cable that we're no longer using. Yes. I know, I know. Oh, that was incredible. Yeah. You can you can eliminate so we used to I used to advertise. I used to tell people you can eliminate literally 90% of the wires uh in 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 your studio. And after seeing a, a number of you know, I, mean, I did some rough calculations to come up with that, but after seeing a number of real world studios and the the you know the mess that got pulled out and was laying in the hallway. Uh yeah, I think I think that's true. All right. Uh this is uh, episode number 145 of This Week in Radio Tech, brought to you by Axia Audio. I should give you the website, axiaaudio.com. That's easy to remember. A-X-I-A, axiaaudio.com. And check out the various consoles there, including the Radius console, which is our lowest price console. List price is like $5,990 or, or about that. It may have gone up a few dollars, but I think it's it's about that. And that's what, what uh, Andrew Zarian has. There's a whole range of stuff. Most things that Telos and Omnia and Axia make plug right into live wire so very easy connectivity all right our guest this week is bill eisenhammer from uh, san diego area in california southern california he is an engineer at the lincoln financial stations plus he does some contract engineering bill tell me what uh, uh, let's talk for a minute about the, the engineering on the side i guess uh, amazingly and i'm so so glad they're like this uh, this is okay with your full-time employer that you do a little work on the side they haven't complained now okay. they will, but they haven't complained. <laughs> well, now, well, you know, somebody, you know, may, maybe Barry or somebody's listening or watching, and uh, I'll get my hands flapped. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'm not uh, going to get trouble. What are they going to do? Yeah. Come on. Well, it's 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 good to keep. Uh, uh, I, I mean, it's it's good to have you know good relations with other stations. We were talking, uh, I think, on the last show about how engineers tend to get along between and among stations, even though the general managers and the ownership may not, because you have to. If you need a part, if you're off the air and you need a part and your, st if your friend across town has got it, well, it's a good thing you're friends. Yeah, it, it works well. I, engineering community has always been close. Um, over the years, I've noticed that, you know, the companies keep them, you know, separated a little bit and, eh, what are you guys doing, blah, blah, blah. But overall, we're all... We're all pretty close. We all, you know, chat it up once in a while. We'll see each other once in a while. We'll see each other at the same events because we're at the same events. And it's always been a, a good rapport. And like you said, yeah, if something really seriously goes wrong, these, these guys, they, they all come together. And when it comes to the company, if it doesn't interfere with, interfere with the daily activity of what I need to do for the company, they don't have a problem with it. So... You know, hey, I, I, that's a good attitude. Before the break, I uh, did a little tease about this uh, this thing that uh, these things that are called tin whiskers. And you've got this blog, and it's uh, just terrific. The, uh, the the entries that you make on here, you put some personal notes and engineering notes, and uh, you know, uh, 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 casual thoughts and deep thoughts. 
Uh, tell us, a, uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about this blog, Tech Notes from the Field. Uh, it, it's something that I, you know, since I don't do a lot of hands-on, you know, consult, you know, it's more like a, a, a long-distance consulting, um, mm -hmm. even though I, I do love getting my hands dirty, um, I decided that, you know, why don't I make a little blog and kind of jot down, you know, it's not going to be any proprietary secret stuff, but I'm going to drop down stuff that, hey, we're humans, this is what we deal with, and we have a good time. Sometimes we're frustrated, sometimes we come across something really cool, and you just want to share it. And um, I, I share information that I find, and, and I don't know about, you know, what, what you guys run into, but I know there's engineers that run into situations where you can't get the information out of a, a manufacturer or a tech service has an issue or, you know, there are, you know, I hate to say it, there are some out there that you, you don't get the service that you would expect when you call in for support. And when you find a tidbit of information that could benefit someone else, it, it just kind of drove me into thinking, well, why don't I post a couple things and, and see where this goes and what kind of, kind of feedback I get on it. And, and it's, that's basically what it is, and I, I just kind of was looking at it, and it's funny that you, uh, you know, you did your homework for the show, which is good, um, because we know some of us don't. Um, it, it was a while since I posted last, and you know, sometimes I'll go a while without posting anything, and then something will kick me, and, and I was like, oh yeah, I remember this, and and then I'll uh, write something up on it, or I'll do something recently, and you know, I think. If somebody's serious about doing their job, I would like to share this so they can also share in the, in the knowledge. It's, why keep it to yourself? So, so on the subject of, of these, uh, these tin whiskers, this is your latest blog post. And not that you're the, the ultimate expert on these. You, you point to uh, an article called Tin Whiskers Are Real and Complex uh, from a website. It's uh, eeweb.com. And uh, it, I, I wasn't familiar with this website until you pointed it out. What what are tin whiskers, and is and uh, do I have to be worried about them? Uh, I I think anybody using uh, modern electronics should have some knowledge of it. Uh -huh. uh, it, it was kind of interesting because I you know like my uh, blog today, I, I just happened to be poking around and it's like oh, oh I'm gonna follow this and and like I said yeah he, he hit this. Uh, article that was on the uh, EE web and I started going reading it because it rang a bell. I was talking to a manufacturer about um, some issues uh, that we weren't experiencing but I was told that you know you might want to keep an eye out for it just because it's it's a serious and it's, it's a, a true problem. Uh, tin whiskers um, sounds kind of funny <laughs> and like, like the article says, they are real. Um, since it, 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 if you go in depth in the article, it's a pretty deep article. Um, they, they give you a lot of details. And there is the question, is lead the problem? Um, and most of us would jump to the conclusion of yes. Uh, we've mm -hmm. moved away from lead-based solders. We've moved away from you know, all, the, all the good stuff that we used to inhale in the past and wonder why our lungs still work today, to pure tin, um, other substances that uh, are used uh, for manufacturing electronics. Um, and one of the phenomena that has come up, tin whiskers, are basically these little microscopic fibers, con you know, conductive fibers that will kind of grow from the surface of yeah. an electronic yeah. component or something. Like and, a whisker. <laughs> and it's like a whisker, right. Yeah, you know, you, you don't really know they're there. Um, they, I think, are accelerated more by dust, um, also other impurities, because anytime you have something that's a pure uh, form, it will react with something that's not. Um, and these things will happen and it, it just kind of rang a bell about this conversation and this conversation I had uh, with this manufacturer was um, got to be two years now and 
so yeah, I, I've actually, you know, been aware of this in talking with them. They said that they had to redesign how they placed a shield on some of their electronic PC boards. Their, right, because the, 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 you know, the danger here is that tin whiskers growing out of uh, leads or landings or uh, you know, various parts that have, have tin in them, um, they, they can grow and, and, and break off and, and, short, and fall and short something, or just where they are. They could, if, if you have very small spaces between conductors, as we do with microelectronics nowadays, uh, they can, can short something out just, just from where they grow. I was yeah. just looking here that they 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 believe that uh, tin whiskers um, caused the failure of the Galaxy Four satellite in 1998, um, well, and also tin, uh, tin tin whiskers also can uh, behave like extra capacitance or antennas at high frequencies, like like what you might have in in satellite communications, six gigahertz and on higher up from that. Well, even some terrestrial communications as well. Right. Well, especially with uh, today's uh, um, gigahertz uh, microwaves, um, unlicensed and licensed, it's oh yeah, it's a serious serious issue. And what's interesting is you you could have an issue, you don't know what's causing your problem, it goes away. Well, what happened? Well, the whisker broke, and now it's not shorting or whatever. It comes back a little. You know, who knows how fast they grow, but it comes back another month later, and you have this problem. Troubleshooting is very difficult. So one of the uh, one of the suggestions is if you have um, a suspected issue, you you get that canned air, and you have a surface with a shield or you know something that is prone to getting dust in it. And and if anybody is anybody in the engineering world has opened up a console in a radio station that has humans, it can get pretty ugly in there. Um, so if this is happening to you in one of your components, blow it out. And you most likely won't have the problem for a while. Hey, there's, a, there's another subject I want to uh, touch on for, for a minute, and that is um, you wrote back in June about PPM qualifying. Of, of course, San Diego's a big market. Uh, you've got uh, personal people meters there. And so on, I would guess, every signal you send out from every facility that you work at uh, it's got to be PPM encoded if they want to get credit for people listening to it uh, and be recognized by the advertising community. So yes, talk to me about talk to me about this. You wrote about PPM qualifying. What does that mean? You know, if, if a lot of people, if you know, you're not in an Arbitron rated market now, or has PPM, or if you're just on the side and you're always curious about it, and, and people have these things. Well, every year, depending on and when Arbitron gets back to you, um, I'll get a phone call and they'll say, we, we, need, we, we need to qualify you. Well, basically what they're doing is they need a, a sample of audio, roughly five minutes, um, so they can verify, and it's, and it's off-air audio, that their encoding is working as they see it should, um, that there's no degradation, there's no issues, um, and in a way, it's a good thing for the stations that are relying on this. This is, you know, PPM ratings. That's our livelihood. This is commercial radio. This is, this is what makes or breaks us nowadays. Um, if you have a, a, an encoder going bad, but the monitor still says it's good, you as the station engineer, station owner, has... We have no clue if something's going wrong with PPM because we have no way of monitoring it except for another box that's you know provided to us by Arbitron. So they do this the qualifying and they in, in a way in in the past when we first started it, I would feed them an audio feed down the phone line. Mm -hmm. That's how robust uh, PPM encoding is supposed to be. So you're just taking an off-air feed, holding the phone up to your speaker, and away you go. Um, let, let, let me stop. Let me stop for a second and just and, and just recover, uh, recover briefly recover. what PPM encoding is. It is a a sub audible or a not audible, not supposedly not audible signal that is sent along with active audio on any uh, communication channel like a radio station, an HD two channel, uh, um, uh, a web stream, 
And this contains a code that identifies the source of audio, that identifies that station to a pager-sized uh, listening device. So right. it's supposed. the idea is that if you wear this pager, it will record, not literally record the audio, but it will make note of what audio sources you were exposed to as you move about during your day. And then the pager reports back to Arbitron, uh, hey, today this person spent two and a half hours in the presence of this station, 12 minutes in the presence of this station, 14 seconds in the presence of this station, and reports all that back to Arbitron. So Arbitron now, rather than relying on diary write-down and recollection and, and doing all that all at the last minute like people are prone to do, this actually records what people were exposed to. Doesn't it tell you if they were listening or not, but it does tell you if they were exposed to it. And the technology is amazingly robust such that you can even send a, you know, if, if you know, your station, KSON, is that it? Um, yep. you know, well, if you just If you just play that down a phone line, a freaking phone line, uh, at the other end, they can they can decode, they can sense that PPM uh, masked uh, yep. code and and determine, yep, that's KSON in San Diego. That's their main that's their main analog, or it's their HD two or whatever. And so it's it's very robust. That's very cool that somebody invented this and perfected it pretty well. So I'm sorry, I interrupted yeah. your story. Go, no, go right it, ahead it, with this. It makes this sense. It, and, and you said it right. It's, it's when you're in the presence of a signal that's encoded. Um, and it, it is kind of cool. It's kind of like, uh, taking the good old subaudible Q tones from the past and modernized it. So now you can actually get real data out of it. Um, so going through this qualification, um, I decided that, Hey, I got a call this year, blah, blah, blah. And, and setting up the phone calls and doing that, um, the last time it was done just seemed kind of bulky. So I, <laughs> took advantage of how I have things set up in my office and I took my air feed and, and basically just recorded about five minutes of audio right into my computer and buttoned it up and said okay emailed it off to Arbitron <laughs> did I have to do all my stations so you know this includes uh, my pea shooter which is almost not able to be received at our station but um, at our, our facilities but I can pick it up it's got multipath in it and it it gets encoded and it's able to be decoded and then I packaged up all my feeds and sent them back back to Arbitron and I said yeah try this out and see what you think and they came back and said everything's fine we got it we got what we needed and that was it so now I know how I'm gonna do my qualifying from now on get the phone <laughs> call or email and say Okay, trying to record some bits of audio and, and get it. Um, if uh, I, I'm not sure which, again, it, it depends on how you feed your logger. Um, in our case, we have many different feeds going into our uh, logger. Um, and I don't think it's the uh, air feed since we use for our stations uh, because we use it for uh, you know, skimming and all that fun stuff. So the audio quality and audio is not off air. So... I set it up so our air monitors, I can, I can record that at my desk or anywhere in any studio and package it up, MP3, and send it on its way, and, and we're good to go. Um, so, so anybody the, the, who this, didn't the, think of that, I posted it. You know? the, this qualification uh, process, is this a one-time thing? or I, The way you're talking, this sounds like something you do on a, on a regular basis, once a year, six yeah, months. I How it, often do you need I believe it? Do. I, I believe it is annual. Okay, okay. Well, we and and we, and that's that's good to check that because you know, in in bigger markets, literally uh, a million dollars or more can be riding on um, the movement of a few tenths of a point of um uh, of, of 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 listenership. So you want to make sure that you're transmitting the PPM signal, that you're transmitting it in that that nothing in your air chain is messing it up or making it um difficult to receive. You want that signal to be very receivable by anyone yeah, who's exposed it, to that audio. Yeah. It's it's definitely important to uh, commercial radio stations and especially in the big markets where everybody subscribes to it. It's you know we we have to monitor it. We have to make sure you know things are there and you know and in in the case of encoders, <clears throat> all our stations have a, a backup encoder, so they're they're ready to go if if an encoder fails. 
Do you even have a backup encoder on, say, the web streams? Yes. Wow. All, wow, all, a- all streams, all three streams have an encoder and a backup. All our uh, main signals have an encoder and a backup. Uh, currently, it's kind of rare for uh, uh, a large market. Um, we're not doing much in the HD2 realm, but uh, when we, uh, we had an HD2 station going on one of our stations because the PD was experimenting with something, uh, Arbitron shipped out a whole package. So we had two encoders and a monitor show up. So everything is, everything is a redundant, making sure that it's covered. Well, uh, two of my stations are in Indianola, Mississippi, and I can tell you that is not a PPM market. It's not, and then you get to save rack space because you, you think <laughs> yeah. about rack space on this stuff. Oh, I've seen it. I, here in, in Nashville is a PPM market. I've been to uh, some stations here that just, yeah, have a whole rack full of encoders. Unbelievable. Yep. It, it just it's adds just, that second level of complexity. Hey, uh, we've got just a few more minutes on the show. By the way, you are watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech, episode number 145. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host, and uh, our guest today is Bill Eisenhammer uh, from the San Diego area, Southern California. He is the uh, uh, chief engineer, director of engineering, market engineer, whatever, for uh, the Lincoln Financial Stations. And uh, I've, I've been wanting to have him on the show for quite a while. Also, Bill has a blog that's pretty interesting if you want to go check it out now and then. Uh, it's called Tech Notes from the Field. If you just Google Bill Eisenhammer, well, tell you what, look for our. We'll have it in our show notes. We'll we'll give it a link to the to his blog site there. And uh, we were just talking about an article that he linked to about tin whiskers, which is kind of interesting. Bill, let's let's um, uh, chat for just another minute about uh, your thoughts on studios, studio construction, kind of uh, what where you find how are things different now than they were. 20 years ago when you started in, in this. Uh, just your thoughts on, on you know, designing and building studios nowadays. Smaller. Everything's smaller. smaller. It, it, even, in, even in the last uh, few years, it's, it's smaller. Um, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, from large consoles, I, I still have 32 uh, input frames in a couple of studios, but anything recent, um, the most recent is a, a 16 channel frame because of as you, as you well know with uh, your axia system we don't use um, that at our place but uh, mm-hmm. most of uh, most of the manufacturers have gone the same line um, with their their surfaces and being so routable and the sources are you know not as many in the studio you end up with smaller work surfaces and ah. uh, you you don't need them, um, and it's not necessarily because you don't have people. People still use them. You just don't need them. One of our workhorse rooms is uh, 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 an eight uh, slot surface, eight six six active channels, and of course you're monitoring and, and headphone controls or whatnot. Um, yeah. And that's the workhorse. That room gets the most use for from voice tracking to production. Um, it's, it's compact and everything's right there where they want it. Um, and of course it looks interesting because you have a monitor tree with four monitors on it because everything's also computer based. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, yeah, and, and, I was just thinking, I've, I got something similar. Uh, my radio station in, in Cleveland, Mississippi, a little country station, uh, our, our audio console there has six faders. And then, you know, headphone and, uh, and studio monitors. But they do the morning show and then they do production all day long with a six-fader console. Right. So it's smaller. I, I can take uh, most of my rooms and cut them, cut them in half or cut them in thirds and, and have that many more, you know, available production air rooms if need be. You know, um, and it, course, it used to it's be. not practical. Y- years ago, I, I built you know a number of studios with traditional analog consoles, and um, uh, we would always think, how how big a console do we need? Do we need eight faders, 10, 12, 16, 20 faders? What do we need? And you'd count the number of sources in the room that you used regularly, and those would go on the A inputs. And then you'd right. count maybe a few things that you used occasionally, and you'd put those on the B inputs. Well, we don't have to do that anymore. Now... 
the way we typically size a console, at least an Axia console, but I would imagine you know others as well that are very flexible and perhaps software based, is you think about the most complicated show you'd ever do, and that's how many faders you need. That's exactly what you do. You what sources are going to be the active sources? Well. You have a morning show of four people. Well, you got four microphones. Those are active all the time. You're not going to mess with those. You have your uh, playout system, whether it's uh, Next Gen or Enco or whatever. You got that. How many faders are you going to place on that? Are they mixing? Or are they going to have one? So you, once you narrow it down, you find that you know your sources and everything that you're using is going to be. If it's a complex morning show, I you know sixteen you know faders is is enough nowadays um, with the flexibility of dialing, you know, oh, I need this source, boom, bring it up. Or if, the, if you can configure your console and it has extra set of buttons, you configure them with sources. It's, it's so configurable. That's one thing I really love about moving forward in technology is, well, how much control can I have? How much control can I give an on-air talent? And how much control do they really need? Yeah. And yeah. From the back end, engineering, you want as many features and stuff as you want, but on the front end, you want to keep it as simple as possible so you don't confuse said operator on air talent using it. You want them to concentrate on their show. So everything we design is based on that. Bill, this hour has flown by. I know that we could talk for hours about studio design. I'd love to hear more of your thoughts about that. I know we spent half the show talking about RF, and uh, you uh, you told me earlier that one of your one of your own personal strong points is you just have a knack for being able to make things work. Uh, things that may not be working or not working well together, you're pretty good at, at at making them work the way they should or the way you want them to. W would you spend just a minute about that, and then we'll have to to wrap it up. Tell us about about the notion of you know I'm just good at making stuff work. The, the notion, it, it comes from the fact that in, in how many times you run into this is you buy something based on what sales told you it's going to be. This is what we're going to do. This is what it can do. Oh, okay, I like this. And you compare it to other people. You know, okay, this is the best one I got. How many times do you get something laid out in front of you and you look at it and you try to make it do what you were told it's supposed to do and it doesn't? Well, now you got to go back and go, okay, well, we wanted this and we got this and we can't send it back. So you work on it and you find a way to integrate it with everything else that come in with te digital technology today, integration of everything to make them talk to each other is just, mm -hmm. just gone crazy. Um, so it's, I find it fun to just trying to make things work. Our IT director, same thing. We sit there and we pound our heads on, well, how are we going to do this? We don't have the tools for this yet. And, we, and we'll work something out. And it, it's kind of fun to do that. Um, likewise, we get into it. And uh, one, of the, one of the big things for big markets, small markets, you name it, remote controls. I think I, I mentioned this in, in an email with you is, Everybody needs remote control, but what's the biggest thing that you don't think about? Well, personnel is not there anymore. You don't have uh -huh. all these people. So yeah. monitor and control becomes very important. Now, explaining that to your general manager to say, you need to spend some money on this. Um, you can go high end and, and, and get um, Statmon or whatever, or you can go in the middle or a whole tons of middle middlemen. Um, good products out there, or you go with something you're familiar with, and or or you can go uh, and keep it low end and, and and make it do what you want it to do by you know getting the pieces together. Um, but overall, the bottom line is you need monitor control. And the sooner me, you, anybody who's an engineer, an assistant, or whatever, if you're on vacation, the sooner you can be notified of a potential problem. And you can take care of it, the better you look, and less off of airtime. And yeah. that's, that's been the big concentration over the last couple of years for me, um, is trying to find the best monitoring and controlling that we can afford and, and make happen and, and get things going. And you know, right I, now, we've got, got a good system. 
I think what you just pointed out there is, is really key. Uh, uh, you know, we, we've got we've focused for years on automation. We've uh, we've been focusing uh, for years on um, probably maybe not enough or maybe the wrong way. Streaming and our HD channels getting more more co- content, being being there doing more things. But on the back end, on the back end. When broadcasters try to operate with fewer people, they still have systems that need to be monitored. Alarms need to go off when something goes wrong. You need to be alerted before something that's preventable does go wrong, like over temp, under temp, a door left open, uh, water coming in the building, things like that. So, uh, yeah, you're right. This uh, this notion of monitoring, even though the public never sees this, the general manager never sees it, uh, but somebody needs to see it. Somebody needs to be kept uh, very aware of of what's going on, and, and I, I I like that notion that uh, you know now's the time, and maybe has been, but now's the time to pay attention to automating the monitoring and and corrective processes, so you can be off site and yet uh, almost be as if you were there on site. It's very important in in my mind in having that access via computer, VPN, phone. Still dial up, you know. You still have to, you know. These systems will accept voice commands still, or dial dial pad commands, and like you said, preventive. Trying to get it, especially HD world, uh, profanity delays, you name it. When a station goes off the air, how long does it take before the air monitor trips an off-air silent sense? Could be thirty seconds. Could be a minute. Yeah, well, depending on how much. My of, remote yeah. control tells me it went off instantaneously. Yeah. So yeah. I will be correcting a problem before the on-air talent even knows it's happening. <laughs> That's just because cool. of that delay. Uh, but hey, yeah, we, monitoring preventative yeah. is very, very we, important. We, to make Bill, we got to go, and I, I hope I can persuade you to come back sometime. Um, and, uh, and, oh, and by I'd the way, yeah, back. there's lots of stuff got, to talk about. If you haven't gotten it already, there should be a knock on your door with a pizza pretty soon for the kids. So uh, and for you too. So yeah, maybe I better let you go to that. Class will run into them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, you've been watching This Week in Radio Tech, episode number 145. Our guest has been uh, Southern California engineer Bill Eisenhammer. Bill, thanks again for taking the time to be with us. Appreciate your effort to, to get in front of a, of a camera and a Skype machine and, and talk to us for a little over an hour tonight. Pleasure. I've, I've been following you, and, you know, it has crossed my mind to do it, and I'm, I'm glad you, you got me. And All I'll right. Happy hey, to do it again. Watch, uh, watch on the GFQ website and on uh, thisweekinradiotech.com. We'll put a link to uh, Bill's uh, blog site, uh, Tech Notes from the Field, and uh, you know, something to catch up on every now and then. Our show's been brought to you by Axia Audio and the Axia Radius console, powering uh, podcasters and, and uh, tele- uh, internet broadcasters around the world. Uh, check it out at axiaaudio.com. I can get one of those for me. That's what I got. I got to do. I got to get one of those for me. Um, thanks for joining us. We're going to see you not next week, but in two weeks. Uh, the last Thursday in um, in November, uh, we'll be uh, on with our guest uh, Kevin Smeal from uh, well from right under Hurricane Sandy, that's where he was uh, on this week in Radio Tech. So, all right, we'll see you next time on this week in Radio Tech. Bye bye, everybody. That's all the bandwidth we can pill for this week. Another tort has propagated, and all the transmitters and audio equipment live happily ever after, thanks to the handsome engineer and his kind, benevolent care. We'll be back next week. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. This week in Radio Tech. Subscribe to iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Search for This Week in Radio Tech in the iTunes Store. Soliciting is strictly encouraged. If you liked today's show, tell a friend. If you didn't like it, we were never here. Kirk Harnack's wardrobe provided by the Salvation Army and the Red Cross Disaster Relief Services. Hair and makeup provided by Penny Lope Garcia Hernandez Weinberg. He's unique, wouldn't you say? I just want to get it over with. This ends this transmission. Tango, Whiskey, India, Romeo, Tango. Signing off. Okay. Okay. <laughs>